welcome back. I hope you could use your roughly 15 minutes time for having a coffee or another break. We're coming to another round of uh, rather short presentations presenting the project key output outputs. And Tina Primosic will present the guidelines for policymakers, and Anna Krivaric will then present the manual for protected area managers and also the CETO network platform. Tina is, is from the Regional Development Center in Koper and is one of the Slovenian project partners. So maybe Tina, you could start with your presentation. Hello everyone. Thank you for the particip participation at the final conference. I will ask Veronica to put my presentation on. Hopefully Monica is, uh, Veronica, is, yes, Veronica is back from the coffee break. <laughs> Uh, meanwhile, uh, yes, uh, I'm Tina Primožić from Regional Development Center Koper from Slovenia and uh, uh, I will give you a short presentation of the guidelines for developing sustainable tourism in protected areas for policy makers. Um, structure of my presentation will be done by answering uh, these four questions. So what are the CITO guidelines, what is the aim, who can use it and where you can find it. Okay, next one. Um, so, I'm going to start with the first question. What are CITO guidelines? Uh, CITO guidelines are a document made by our external expert, Marko Koscak from Studio MKA, then our colleagues from the Hungarian organization, Infea, and uh, me from Regional Development Center, Koper. And uh, part of the guidelines are also contributions from all other partners from CITO project. Okay, next one. Thank you. Um, CITO guidelines are the synthesis of the work done uh, during the CITO project and consist of a summary of a handbook on successful and innovative practices for uh, sustainable uh, tourism inside protected areas, synthesis of the pilot action results and evaluations, and reports uh, on the internal and independent evaluation of pilot actions. Okay, next one, please. Uh, in general, we could say that the guidelines are divided in three main parts, uh, where first part covers the general background about sustainable tourism and its principles and approaches. Uh, here you can find some uh, theoretical platform of sustainable tourism, then about importance of uh, the stakeholders involvement, description of four internationally accepted policy guides, uh, which should be observed by policy makers uh, and sustainable tourism managers, and uh, steps needed to prepare a strategy and uh, action plans. Um, the second part consists of planning, uh, management and monitoring tools. On the picture you can see, and you already see, um, a mix of well-known tools. Uh, these tools can be further enhanced and developed by introducing other techniques or transformed in case we didn't uh, reach the objectives. And because of that, it's also important to uh, do a constant monitoring. Um, the next one, please. And uh, then is followed the description uh, of the eight pilot actions. So the examples how uh, these tools were used in practice. Um, the pilot actions are described with uh, which monitoring tools they choose, activities and uh, what they achieved. And uh, this part is finished with the two summaries of evaluations, um, one internal, done by protected areas themselves on the basis of the structured interviews and questionnaires which were implemented among their stakeholders and the second one made by external experts and down you can see some uh, pictures from our protected areas um, while implemented pilot uh, actions so in the last of uh, the part three are recommendations. Um, recommendations uh, have been made on the basis of the assessments of uh, pilot actions and provide information about what policymakers and other stakeholders uh, could do in planning sustainable tourism in protected areas through, through different uh, chapters. 
Uh, first one is sustainable tourism development and implementation, decision-making process and cooperation with uh, stakeholders, monitoring and evaluation. Yeah, next one. Um, here is the example of uh, cross indicators, which were used in uh, Croatia. And final, uh, our uh, list of uh, final conclusions and recommendations. Here you can see just some of them. Um, the next one, please. So what is the aim of the CITO guidelines? Uh, we could say that the link between protected areas and uh, tourism is old as uh, the history of uh, protected areas and uh, their relationship is very complex. And uh, we have to consider uh, tourism as a critical component and uh, in the establishment and also in management of protected areas. And because of that is essential effective manager uh, management. And uh, it has to ensure that nature is uh, conserved in the park and its, uh, in its surroundings. And uh, management activities must include planning and monitoring and also cooperation with local people and other stakeholders uh, to balance uh, nature protection and also their needs uh, and aspirations. And uh, closely linked with the uh, management and or, or poor management are on the other side treats from uh, uh, human activities and also illegal human activities that occur in uh, protected areas. For example, breaking park rules, poaching of protected animals, parking problems and such activities are a treat to protected area and uh, lead to pollution, introduction of invasive species and degradation of such vulnerable uh, environment. So uh, these guidelines aim to build an understanding of protected area tourism and its management and provide a theoretical platform and uh, practical guidelines for policymakers <coughs> sorry, and managers to ensure that tourism contributes uh, to the purposes of protected areas and does not undermine them. Um, so um, the next one, please. Uh, who can use CITO guidelines? As I mentioned before, CITO guidelines will serve uh, to support uh, policy makers at international, national and regional level to increase their capacity in developing sustainable tourism policies because they have potential power to shape tourism, for example, on how it is promoted, planned, managed and regulated. And also for park managers and other conservation practitioners to ensure that tourism is well managed and support conservation objectives. <clears throat> so, and the next one, the last one, where you can find it and download it, um, <clears throat> sorry, uh, guidelines and other tools are developed in CITO network and uh, will be <clears throat> uh, available in six different languages. So <laughs> thank you for all you for uh, your attention and sorry because my voice is gone. <laughs> thank you, Tina. I hope you find your voice again. <laughs> Thanks for this presentation. And we pass the word to uh, Anna. Anna Grivaric is from the WWF Edward program uh, from the Zagreb office. And Anna is going to present first the manual and then the network platform. Anna, please. Yes, thank you, Christian. Uh, I hope you all hear me. Uh, it is a pleasure to be a part of uh, this CITO project and also to present uh, some of our outputs uh, here in the final conference. So um, I am a project officer of CITO project in WWF Adria, uh, one of CITO project partners responsible for the development of CITO manual of sustainable tourism governance for protected areas and CITO network and its online platform. Veronica, next slide, please. Okay. Um, here is the overview of um, what I will talk about in my presentation. So I will speak about the manual and what is its aim, uh, to whom it is addressed, uh, how it was developed and uh, what can be found in it. Also, I will talk about CITO network and its online platform. What are they? Uh, what is their aim and how to use uh, the platform? Veronica, please, next slide. Well, we all know that um, tourism in natural destinations is increasing at a fast rate and the faster and more intense tourism development occurs in a natural area, 
the more it changes it. In order to manage the complexities of the protected area and also to increase the quality of protected area governance, managers and practitioners need a wide range of skills and expertise. And the CITO manual of sustainable tourism governance is a basic and practical tool to support managers and practitioners to realize development and management of sustainable tourism in their protected area. Uh, the manual can also be used by local stakeholders and partners of protected areas to get a general overview of sustainable tourism governance processes in protected areas. Veronica, next slide, please. So a little bit about the development of a manual. The preparation of the manual was based on experience of eight CITO pilot case studies, which were presented earlier this morning. Also on previously developed CITO documents, like CITO handbook uh, of sustainable tourism inside protected areas that was also presented this morning. Also, uh, Tina presented the CITO guidelines uh, for developing the sustainable tourism and we developed also a manual based on information in those guidelines and uh, we also based the work on CITO guidelines for protected areas to work with tour operators uh, and these guidelines were built on the extensive experience of the uh, Europark Federation European Charter for Sustainable Tourism in Protected Areas. The work was also based on uh, relevant documents produced by the IUCN UNWTO um, and Charter, as I already mentioned, just to name a few, and um, also for the project, also based on the projects, um, EU projects that were implemented and uh, are related to, to this topic of sustainable tourism in protected areas. Okay, Veronica. Um, Although we use previously developed CITO documents, information is not solely repeated in this manual, but important messages from those documents were extracted and uh, shaped in uh, actually this easy to use manual. So a little about the structure of the manual. Manual is uh, conceptualized in few chapters. First, as an introduction, I present the uh, presented guiding principles and international framework for sustainable tourism in protected areas. And uh, as Tina already showed on uh, her presentation, here we mentioned Convention on Biological Diversity, International Union for Conservation of Nature guidelines, European Commission guidelines, and European Charter for Sustainable Tourism in Protected Areas. Following this is the elaboration of the development and management processes of sustainable tourism in protected areas, which includes uh, various topics that you can see on the right-hand side of the slide. So these are tourism and visitation management in protected areas, stakeholder engagement, communication, education, interpretation, socioeconomic benefits for local communities, competences and capacity building of protected area staff, certification and quality labels, as well as visitor safety and climate change. As a concluding chapters, there are overview, short overview of CITO pilot cases which presents how uh, exactly those protected areas included in CITO project implemented the tourism governance model in their areas. And as a concluding, a list of useful literature for further reading and deepening the knowledge. Uh, next slide, Veronica, please. So uh, basically how it uh, looks like uh, to suit the needs of protected area managers and practitioners, this manual is intended uh, like a cookbook, as we like to call it. So anyone who embarks on the process of sustainable prison development in protected areas can easily follow. And here is the example of one of processes or topics that were mentioned in the slide before. So on the left-hand side, we start by explaining what is our current state in the protected areas. So what we know, what we don't know, what information or equipment we have or what we don't have. And then we start questioning what we can do to make a change we want. And then we give basic steps on how to implement the process. It is important to say that the numerous practical uh, case studies um, uh, are, are uh, presented in the manual and they support this form formal explanation of processes. Um, as was already said, the manual and all of the documents prepared in the CITO project uh, are available in the CITO network online platform, which I will present in coming slides. So Veronica, please, if you can go to another slide. Okay, thank you. Briefly about CITO network. 
CETO network was uh, founded by CETO project partners from six Central European countries and uh, their associated partners with an aim to cooperate uh, during and after CETO project. So current members are international, national, regional and local level bodies that take part in nature conservation, management of protected areas and sustainable tourism development. Uh, during project duration, members continuously cooperated in the project activities implemented and uh, sharing their experience. And they were also involving relevant stakeholders and inform informing those stakeholders uh, about knowledge and experience gained in the project. And this opened a possibility for future cooperation. For example, um, we prepared and sent invitation to relevant universities and research institutions to visit CETO pilot areas and share our experience with students or and scientific staff. Um, the network is open to new members uh, interested in cooperation and um, currently there is no special procedure of, of joining the network, only expression of interest um, is required. Um, as the network was developed for the project purposes, uh, now we define next steps of network nourishment and continuation of our cooperation. And um, as one of tools to continue this cooperation, the network developed CIT online platform. It serves uh, as a networking and knowledge sharing hub on sustainable tourism in protected areas and conserved areas. So here on slide, above you can see the address of the platform and below in the picture how it is structured. Uh, Veronica, please, next slide. So uh, as I've already mentioned, the aim of the platform is to ensure the wide transfer of CETA results and best practices. Um, the, the aim is also to uh, enable discussion through the exchange and transfer of knowledge, ideas and innovation and also to facilitate cooperation and development uh, of common uh, initiatives and projects, and therefore to foster cohesion to make Europe more resilient to external pressures. It is important to say that the registration to the platform is simple, and it is also free of charge. Veronica, please, uh, next slide. Okay, so um, registration to the platform offers opportunity to publicly and privately discuss sustainable tourism topics and also possibility to start uh, to develop new joint initiatives and um, registered user can easily do it by using discussion section of the platform either by posting uh, its story experience news or interesting document or by posing question to already existing post there is also possibility to send post only to a specific registered member or members, so you can exchange uh, easily in close communication. Also, a uh, platform offers uh, availability of numerous relevant resources like documents, uh, publications, relevant web pages, and case studies. And those could be found on the um, document section of the platform. In this section, there is already a number of CETA documents produced under the project. Mostly interesting might be the ones regarding CETO pilot cases under the folder name Action Plans and Pilot Actions. Uh, and also interesting might be folder name Sustainable Tourism, uh, where all CETO manual, guidelines, handbook, and also webinars and this final conference uh, will be deposited, and some of them already are. And also we offer, a uh, platform offers a quick access to a glossary of important terms in relation to sustainable tourism in protected areas, and it can be found in the glossary section uh, of the platform. Important thing is um, a guide on how to use and navigate the platform. It is a document prepared and it is also uploaded on the platform. And it, is, it, can, all, uh, it can also be found on the document section uh, of the platform. And now, um, as you saw, I haven't disclosed many pictures of the platform. Uh, so I hope you got curious and interested to explore it uh, soon by yourself. And uh, as a concluding slide, uh, in case you will have any question uh, regarding using the platform or navigating it, you can uh, reach us um, with contacts mentioned here. And with this, I finish my presentation and thank you all for your attention. Thank you very much, Anna. You definitely managed to make us curious and I hope there is a lot of uh, people then using the links that you provide. I just remind you also to put some questions and if, if you put a question in the chat room, it would be good that you also address the speaker, uh, that you're precisely asking something. We're collecting the questions and we'll come back to, to that then later in the afternoon. 
We're coming now to the second part before the lunch break, which is a section where we have three external experts giving you some inputs about ecotourism in general, about uh, challenges, uh, practical solutions, some requirements for management. And I do now something that usually a moderator should not do, meaning changing the, the role from being a moderator to being a speaker for the next uh, while, for the next 20 minutes. But for this time, I would ask you then also, I would ask Veronica to take a little bit an eye on the time and uh, remind me if I'm overusing my, my time. So I'm just sharing my remind you if you are too long. <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> okay. The task and the challenge for me now for the next minutes is to talk a little bit about uh, lessons learned, good lessons learned, and also not so good lessons learned from different ecotourism practices. And for starting this, I would like to go a little bit into not really into history, but if you ask people what they associate with ecotourism you have this cloud of, of word coming up. I mean, it's about the environment, but it's, it's green, it's vacation, it's an ecological, it's natural, it's traveling, of course, backpacking, it's conservation. So you see they're very much focusing on the environment. And this obviously is related with the term eco in ecotourism. But if we look to the development of the definition, there is a long history of this development and started with the Ecotourism Society in 1965, saying that tourism in protected areas, or at least natural areas, is ecotourism. They did not talk any word about the local population, about local services, about local benefits. It was just protected areas. And we will see in the next minutes that not every tourism to a protected area is automatically ecotourism. But later on, this the term and the definition of ecotourism changed and still the Ecotourism Society, some 30 years later, defined ecotourism as responsible travel to natural areas that both on the one hand protects the environment, but on the other hand also improves the well-being of local people. So you see suddenly local people are part of ecotourism. It's not only about the, the environment. And then we find also some kind of strange definitions. I once collected around 120 different definitions of ecotourism. The, one of the really strangest ones I found 97, 1997 in the Journal of Sustainable Tourism, saying that an area to which a person travels and which he or she considers to be a relatively undisturbed natural area. So it, it is in the perspective in this definition of the consumer, if an area is undisturbed or natural or not. And which is even more strange is which is more than 40 kilometers from home. So this would mean that in a distance of less than 40 kilometers, you could not do any ecotourism. But as I said, this, this term changed a lot. And again, if you ask people what they think about ecotourism destinations, what is really coming first and to most of people's mind is Galapagos. And I would like to show you with this example of Galapagos, which is a national park and which is a protected area, that not everything that's called even ecotourism is environmentally friendly. And here I'm not talking about the, uh, the travel, this long distance travel for very often rather short stays. I'm also talking about the environmental impact in this uh, group of, of islands. I mean, it, it is really a fantastic scenery. You, you will imagine being a tourist there that there, the natural distances for escape of the, the wildlife is not existing there. So you can easily, you come very close to, to the animals. And if looking around, you might mention, you might realize that everything is really environmentally friendly here. Even the airport is an ecological airport at Galapagos. So I don't know how they make it, but at least they market that. But that's not the full story, of course. I mean, there is, yes, there is a, a protected area, but it definitely has some capacity limits. And once WWF, together with the National Park Authority, defined the ca uh, carrying capacities, and today this carrying capacity is exceeded more than 20 times by the number of tourist arrivals. So actually, no one is really respecting the carrying capacity at Galapagos. And, 
you really need to ask the question, how much interference can an ecosystem tolerate if you see the, the details of how it works in, in tourism uh, at the Galapagos Islands. So one, and, and very often it's really a small path between a touristic use of ecosystems, which can and which should also generate local income, which on the other hand then is necessary to protect the ecosystems, and on the other side, the overuse by economic greed, I would say. And one message from the Galapagos is yes, we need limits. We do set, we, need, we do need to set limits of carrying capacities or limits of acceptable change. And then second message, we have to respect the limits. This was the first view to a national park, to a protected area. My second approach is about a little bit more about tourism development in, in general. And there is a, a, a big trend of instillation of staging tourism for the tourists, if storytelling, but also huge infrastructure that, that brings in a kind of yeah, instillation of, of nature. And this is then often sold as, as ecotourism. And my question would be, is this just about the nature or is it just for the tourists? So who really has the benefit of staging nature into touristic products? Very often mountain could be a place of wonderful sustainable tourism or ecotourism. And I'm not going to the differences here. There are clear differences between ecotourism and the wider and better concept of sustainable tourism. So mountains could be a place for sustainable tourism and for sustainable ecotourism, but the reality is very often different. The next two slides will show you just projects, but already the fact that there have been those projects uh, that did, or that this idea reached the status of projects is alarming. You might know the, the area of Ischgl from the recent happenings around the, the virus. But uh, we have a very innovative, or he, well, he thinks he's innovative person, Ishke, and he now and then, he was even tourism director in the, in the area and he owns some hotels. And he now and then is coming up with new ideas for installation, for staging the, the scenery. One of these ideas was to build a 150 meter high cross on the, on the peak of one of the mountains with a turbo lift that brings uh, 50 persons per minute up to to that cross and he said well this is the new signal of the alps this is how the alps and the environment of the alps should be marketed uh, and installed for the tourists or the other project was this flying bridge the the so-called test of courage again it was just a project idea Already the fact that those ideas do exist are in my understanding alarming. And if we look to the implemented projects, we see that really innovation today is a lot of hardware uh, oriented. And by that, by all that platforms that we have in the Alps, by all that suspension bridges that are the new events to stage nature to the tourists, destinations are also interchangeable. So there's not a big difference between one and the other destinations. Every innovative tourism director at the moment thinks that if he would like to be innovative, he's building either a platform or a suspe suspension bridge. But those ideas sometimes also come from nature protection organizations, like this idea, or this is, this is an implemented project in the Bavarian area of the Alps in the Carvendel. And this telescope was built by a local environmental organization running a small environmental center, an information center up there in the mountains. And the argument is that they think today it is necessary to stage nature that tourists and locals become more aware of what they need to protect. I doubt that concept a little bit. And I do think that we really need to change our perspective, that we need to turn the view that installation works in a different way. And maybe yes, installation and staging of nature is necessary and important, 
but we need to see to different options than putting large infrastructural projects into, into, in, into our ecosystems. A wonderful example that I have is a, a Hungarian photographer living in Romania, Mate Benze, who was building some of these hidden places uh, to watch wildlife. And a lot of ecotouristic activities, uh, seminars for photographers or just excursions are taking place there. And people really have a huge and very impressive experience of wildlife from these heights. Just show you two, three pictures that he and his colleagues and his participants did from those places. Of course, this is a completely different approach to nature, and it's just a small infrastructural project to build up such a, a place. Amazing, isn't it? So yes, I mean, education and educative aspects are an important part of ecotourism, in my understanding. One example from Austria, from the, from the Teichalm, a nature trail that uh, let you, on the one hand, guide the visitor through a very sensitive area of this park. Uh, so it protects the area on the one hand, but it gives also an attractive possibility to experience the, the ecosystem. And this in connection with very attractive natural offers. A trilateral nature park between Austria, Hungary and Slovenia offers, for example, this activity mud between the toes and grass in the ear. So also letting young people, focusing especially on, on children, young people, experience this nature. So installation, in my understanding, is very much connected with storytelling and educational approaches than with big infrastructural projects. So storytelling, gamification, and small-scale infrastructure. But, so we see nature is important for ecotourism, but there are more other important aspects for sustainable ecotourism, sustainable tourism. Again, which is, we are coming now to culture and, and local people. I love, I really love this small niche touristic product. There is this transhumance, so this annual movement of big flock of sheep between the Austrian Ötztal and the Italian Schnalztal, Schnalzwelle. And it's several hundred sheep brought in spring from Italy to Austria and in, in autumn back. And what the local tourism makers produced is a very small touristic product. 15 hikers a year can join this movement. And of course, for them, it's really, really a big experience. They, they're joining the, the shepherds. They can experience this authentic, very old, very traditional life, local life of, of this uh, shepherds and of the sheep movements. So authentic experience is always this mixture of nature and landscape, which is a natural landscape, but also cultural landscape, plus the, plus the local people. And in this respect, I like, again, Romania and uh, Transylvania in specifically very much. There's a lot of, of projects run there, also by the Romanian Ecotourism Association or by members of the Romanian Ecotourism Association. And some of them, for example, look to culinary heritage and really hospitality of people. One of them I just would like to highlight is called Transylvanian Brunch. This was started as an activity for the locals to have a possibility to exchange a little bit old recipes and traditional way of food production and processing local foods. And then suddenly some tourists were there, not on purpose. They just, well, joined and by the hospitality, of course, they've been invited. And step by step, small and tiny, very, very attractive offers for tourists were developed. So several or some, Every, every month or now and then, they offer this Transylvanian brunch in another village. And there is really this added value, of course, for the locals. Raising more awareness for the local products, being able to sell some of the products. Some further training now is involved. So the whole culinary tourism, sometimes combined with piano players, like the, the picture and the right shows. Uh, so this whole culinary tourism is, is developed in, in that area. So this gives really a very important secondary income for the local people 
and enables them also to preserve the cultural way of, of um, farming, which of course contributes to, to biodiversity. Last project I would like to introduce as a very good example, it's also 30 years old already now, it's the Grande Traversate delle Alpi, a long distance hiking trail connecting the Italian Swiss border going more or less along the uh, French Italian border uh, along the Piemont. There's some routes on the, on the French side, some routes or some paths, some stages, day stages on the, on the Italian side. And it's a very abandoned area. Most, many of the, these old stone uh, small villages in the mountains were abandoned. People moved to the centers like Cuneo, Torino. And, and this kind of Traversate delle Alpi managed to reanimate the local use of the houses. So some people moved back to offer uh, ac small accommodations or some cultural centers like this in the, in the Val de Mayra uh, were reopened. And this was done by, well, signposting, so developing the paths and by storytelling and by using the interest of more and more hikers in this local heritage, in the, in the regional uh, history, in the regional stories. So modern guidebooks or modern hiking books do combine always this regionality um, with the protection of the landscape of the nature with the hiking tips and interests. And so we have a series of those books and those are highly attractive offers for hikers which on the other hand really contributes to the local benefit to the local regional sustainable development. So to conclude, what are the lessons learned from, in my understanding, successful sustainable ecotourism projects throughout Europe? Ecotourism is, in my understanding, understanding always directly linked with the local culture and it creates regional value, values. And this was already mentioned by several of the the other speakers today. Tourism, especially ecotourism, should be always seen as a part of a more complex regional development. So the purpose is not to develop tourism. The purpose of tourism is to serve and to contribute to sustainable regional development. Local resources, small investments are very often much more effective than large investments, which are often foreign investments and usually then if you have foreign investment also the benefit is going back to the area where the investment is coming from. It's about participation, it was already mentioned today, and lifelong learning. Training, training, training is a key issue for success of sustainable ecotourism projects. So training for and learning for all different stakeholders and this really improves the, the local acceptance and then the innovation of the, of the projects. Very important, we cannot reach sustainable development in two, three years project time. So we need always have, we need to have longer projects. Development, especially sustainable development really needs time. We see that a good project lasts 10 years or even more till you really can judge it if it is yes or no sustainable. Sustainability in my understanding is very often bottom up, very seldomly top down and again this first message we do need limits and we need to have a regional consent of their acceptance and then at the end we need to respect those limits that were set in a common approach thank you very much for your attention veronica was silent so i think i did not overuse my time you were perfect in time it was perfect and i think there were so many tips and and new ideas so we have lots to discuss in the afternoon. Thank you. Later on. Thank you very much. I stop sharing and switch back to, my, to the role as moderator and announce now um, Herbert Wölger. Herbert Wölger has a very interesting background. Uh, I mean, he grew up on a, on a small farm in, in Styria and he studied forestry in, in Vienna. And within the, the, the forest, could you mute your mic? please. I don't know who is... Okay, I did. Yeah. Um, and Herbert was always interested in, in the kind of environmentally friendly forestry and he did that both in Austria and in South America. 
And since 2012, he is manager, director of the Gesäuse National Park in Austria. And his special focus in his directorate currently is, is really the protection and the, the natural processes and the, the wilderness of the, of the area. So I'm very curious of what Herbert is now presenting. Herbert, please, you have the floor. Okay, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Yes, because I bought a new mic. Yeah. And we see you, your slide, that's good. Yeah, okay. Nothing touches like the untouched. This is the translation of Nichts berührt uns wie das Unberührte, which is a claim the Austrian National Parks developed. And the goal of this claim was to concentrate communication on the core elements of national parks, which is to protect natural, dynamic, non-interference, laissez-faire, somehow a concept of wilderness. Not to touch nature refers to not use natural resources and it does not exclude the presence of people, especially tourists. How untouched nature, nature protection and tourism go together, in other words, how park administration and tourism should cooperate, is stated in a position paper of uh, Austria's National Parks, Tourismus in Österreich National Parks. And um, I think that the Gesäuse acts like a role model in this process. So let me see, yes, here you see the cover of this paper and the location of Gesäuse quite in the middle of Austria. The Gesäuse is characterized by uh, wild water and a steep rock. It's the youngest national park in Austria, but we have a long uh, history of touristic activities which go back uh, to the uh, 19th century. Uh, Gesäuse is famous for climbers and uh, it was opened when in the 1870s uh, the first train railway led through the Gesäuse. We have visitor pressure but uh, not as heavy as in, other, as in other parks and uh, so we are kind of a lucky position. We do not know exactly how many visitors we have. We, we think it might be something between 100 and 200,000 per year. So some general uh, um, words to conservation and tourism. There are some basic points that have to be considered because in any case, people, visitors can disturb our protect protection goals. Sometimes it's uh, wildlife which is uh, disturbed. Sometimes we are confronted with plans for more infrastructure, uh, like uh, in our case, uh, there were people uh, trying to do new Bia Ferratas. Traffic is, uh, I think, in every park, in every protected area, kind of a problem. And uh, sometimes uh, the problem itself is the behavior of uh, visitors. It's about quantity, I would say. Uh, speaking with Paracelsus, the dose makes the poison. And uh, uh, we uh, have a wide range of tools, I would say, uh, to, to, to keep everything uh, in harmony, that start with, starts with prohibition, regulations. Uh, you can ha have no-go areas. We do have some no-go areas and ends with uh, information. Information and visitor guidance are far more effective. Um, that's my, uh, my personal uh, view and therefore more important than prohibitions. So the question is, how do we cooperate here in Gesäuse? The National Park sets values and the Tourism Association supports these values. So that's the core. In other words, the National Parks 
values plays a crucial role in the promotion, in touristic promotion. Uh, what do I mean with values? Values like uh, national park, untouched nature, visitor guidance, and in some sense also the national parks rule we state. When we say we don't like drones, to give you an example, because they disturb wildlife, wildlife and it might also bother other visitors, the Tourism Association accepts this rule. And uh, they, uh, they, they had a photo contest last year, and they, in the contest it was, uh, uh, there, there was some, some uh, drone photos, and they did not accept the drone photos although there were some nice photos for the contest because it's against national park rules. And uh, another uh, uh, example maybe, um, those daily traffic uh, loads we have in the national parks uh, are not good for nature, are not good for anything. And therefore the tourism association seeks possibilities decrease the number of daily visitors and to increase the number of overnight stays. Let me give you some projects. I have prepared four projects that will, uh, that will show you what we developed between National Park Protected Area and the uh, Tourism Board. The first example is our partner network, which we created in order to facilitate, facilitate communication. The problem is uh, how do we communicate our values to visitors? Uh, direct communication is not so easy. You can print folders, uh, do information points, we do it, uh, all of us uh, do that. But the best and most effective way is to let, uh, to, to have those oral uh, communication ways and let uh, uh, people who live in the area, when they speak with visitors, uh, transport our values. So in our partner network, the, the, the uh, companies serve as communication channel and that's the most important uh, thing which they can do for us. Second example, winter visitor guidance. Uh, a problem which uh, uh, we know all over the Alps, inside and outside uh, protected areas. Biggest pressure on wildlife is usually in winter time. And uh, it's a quite new problem because 30 years ago, ski touring uh, was not really a topic. Today it is. The boost of ski touring uh, becomes, I would say, critical for the survival of some species like, like Kapakaili and it's also problematic for others like, uh, like all the hoofed uh, game. So the National Park worked out ski touring routes and the Tourism Association promotes only these routes and they promote also our uh, behavior rules. Quite a new project uh, which we did together is the Lux Trail, the Langs Trail. Our area is uh, the area of a small Langs population. Currently we have six animals, quite small, but inside uh, uh, the Austrian Alps, the biggest population and this population is under pressure. Therefore, we created the Langs Trail to raise public awareness. The trail is a long distance trail which connects, connects the three protected areas. Uh, it's 220 kilometer long, uh, 11 days of hiking. And the, it goes through this uh, habitat of, of the Langs. Long distance walking is a walk, and there are several other trails crossing our area. We have a monastery trail, the so called Via Alpina, a trail from the glacier to the vine, and others more. 
And our tourism association back to our topic uh, is actively promoting only one long distance trail. And this one they, they do promote is the Langs Trail. They made it the leading product for long distance hiking because it's the one who best fits into the values of the region which are set by the national park. Photo festival is another example. Um, photography stands somehow uh, for uh, nature protection and tourism in harmony. We created the Gesäuse School of Photography because we learned that with the help of this medium, we can inspire people for nature. Photographers, usually they have a really closer look at nature. They take the time to explore, to listen, to see. They, are, they have to be calm and adapt to, uh, uh, to, to the country because otherwise they, they wouldn't get the, the pictures they're looking for, especially when it's about uh, fauna photography. And uh, we offer uh, courses, uh, photo seminars, which last several days. So uh, again, not the daily tourist, but the tourists who stays overnight um, to reduce traffic. And furthermore, it gives some uh, earnings, some profit for gastronomy and, uh, and the hotels here in the region. Uh, and uh, with, uh, with, with, all, uh, with other local players like uh, the tourism agency, Stift Admont, uh, uh, the, the town of Admont, uh, we created a photo festival to put more effort on the demo photography. Uh, the second one, the second festival should take place this summer, but uh, well, it was postponed to next year. But photography is about to be more, gain more importance as a touristic feature in the uh, Gesäuse. So I think it's, uh, it's really a kind of, uh, a kind of uh, possibility to bring nature close to visitors and uh, to link tourism and nature protection. I take um, a leaf. I'm almost done with my presentation with a photograph that shows the Gesäuse as it maybe is fascinating, but somehow dangerous. It's a dark sky. It looks like a rough place where nature rules and not man. You don't even see any infrastructure, road, nothing, just the river in the valley. And this photo is a promotion photo of our tourism association a photograph which was played in several folders and uh, also on first page of a magazine and I would like uh, to ask the question which other tourism association dares to advertise with this kind of picture I don't know any so thank you for listening I did not even need my 20 minutes and I hope there was something interesting for you all in my presentation thank you thank you very much Herbert. nature rules not men it was very impressive how you describe also this obviously very fruitful cooperation with your tourism association i think that's one of the also key factors for success to establish this cooperation between protected areas and tourism businesses and and associations thank you again Coming to the last presentation in this row, Maurizio Davoglio is going to talk about slow tourism practice. And Maurizio is, is president of the Italian Association of Responsible Tourism. And when you discuss issues like social tourism or responsible tourism, either in Italy or in, in, in Brussels on the EU level, you always come across Maurizio. He's really, he dedicated his, uh, I don't know, half, full life maybe to to tourism, particular to cooperative tourism. He's also vice president of ISTOS, or the International Social Tourism Organization. He's holding lectures, writing books. So I'm very proud that Maurizio is with us and give you the floor, Maurizio, please.
Oak. Maurizio, are you with us? I see you online. You should be able to share your screen. You have co-moderation rights and you should be able to demute your mic to talk to us. Well, your mic is demuted, okay. I think you, sh you hope, I hope you start your, to share your screen. Maurizio, I have your presentation. Shall I start it for you and, and click on for you? <laughs> Fighting with a <the> technique. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and I thought we're coming through at least to lunch break without any technical problems. Now we have the first one. Maurizio, your mic is open, but if you talk and we cannot hear you, maybe you're right in the chat room. Shall I open the presentation for you and click for you, Maurizio? <laughs> okay, so then I would continue with another task that was planned before lunch break, and we hope uh, during that task, uh, Maurizio can solve the problems. Um, I have another poll, another two questions for you. And the idea was that you could give us now your opinion on, on the project. So you will see in, a, in, a, in some seconds two questions. First one is how do you judge the results produced by the C2 project? And the second one is how much do you think the C2 outcomes can be useful to improve nature conservation and eco-friendly tourism in protected areas? And you have four possibilities from very good to poor. So please give us your opinion and your answer. I start the poll now. Yeah, first one starting. We still have 169 participants online, so I'll still ex I at least expect 150 answers. <laughs> And of course, I only expect positive answers. No, no, I, I expect honest answers. <laughs> so we reached around 70, 80 answers already. Uh, it's climbing up to 90. That's good. Some more people are thinking. <laughs> In the meanwhile, what about Maurizio? I think he, well, he disappeared for the moment. I think he, re, he disconnected and trying to connect hopefully again. Okay, we reached more than 100 answers, 107 answers. Okay, thank you very much. Then I will close the poll in a in a second. So we have 110 answers. I think the, the rest cannot decide or maybe joined later and did not fully listen to all the project outcomes. So I close the poll now. Thank you very much. Perhaps we have a second period of asking after the end of the whole conference. Perhaps the, some people will come then again. Yes, and at the end of the conference, we ask you also about the quality of the conference. Mm -hmm. So let's check if Maurizio is back. No, I don't see him at the moment. Then, I mean, if the host, Veronica, and the lead partner agree. I would say we start with a lunch break now and 
check during the lunch break uh, if Maurizio could join us again, and then we we start after lunch break. Uh, just we have to film. Yeah, 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 yeah. I know that. I don't. <laughs> but basically, um, for all the participants, I have a task for you for the lunch break, meaning for the first ten minutes of lunch break. If you go to the chat room, you will see some links because the CETO project produced an amazing short movie, 10 minutes about sustainable tourism. And it's available in different languages. You see it in English, French, German, Italian, Spanish. And this is why we decided not to show it here online, streamed for you in one of the languages, but to give you the opportunity to watch in maybe your own language. So we would really ask you now to use the first 10 minutes of the lunch break to watch that movie using the link, use it in your browser, and then have a lunch break of all together. The plan was to have 70 minutes lunch break, which from now would be um, a quarter to two. So we start around that a little bit more. So we start at uh, 15 minutes to two, and hopefully with the presentation of Maurizio. I wish you a nice uh, movie and then a good lunch break. See you later.